Uh, so hi, I'm Michael Kleber. I'm a software engineer uh, working on Chrome in the Cambridge, Massachusetts office. And hi, everyone. I'm Costa Bagun. I am an engineering manager also in the Cambridge office. And Michael and I work together on the Chrome Privacy Sandbox team. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, a kind of Chrome umbrella effort uh, called the Privacy Sandbox, but which covers a large collection of different specific projects that I'll try to give you a, an overview of. So let's start by talking about composability on the web. <clears throat> uh, most websites are not constructed in-house from the ground up, right? Websites could have uh, third-party experts who do things like their analytics or their video serving or their recommendations engine or lots of other specialist functions for them. Um, and that's great. Third parties are great. Composability is one of the web's superpowers. Like this is fundamental to what the web is. Um, one huge role that third parties play today is ads. Uh, and sure, Google and Facebook and other giants put ads on their own sites, but most ads on the web come from third parties. When you visit a news site, it probably has ads that were placed there and maybe by Google or Facebook, but also maybe by one of 100 other companies in the ad placing business. And that's great too. Sites across the web earn tens of billions of dollars a year from ads that are placed there by third parties. But there's a problem with this system, uh, privacy. Um, here is uh, the title and snippet from the abstract of a paper uh, published uh, in Pet Symposium in 2018, um, Diffusion of User Tracking Data in the Online Advertising Ecosystem. And their analysis by using an instrumented browser and browsing around top websites and actually looking at the exchanges of information that happened between the browser and the server, their analysis found that 52 companies had access to more than 90% of the average user's browsing history, and 636 companies had access to at least 50%. And these are kind of shocking numbers, I think, even to us as browser developers. Uh, and I expect they're shocking to website developers also. If you're building your own site, you still might not know all the third parties who could be pulled in when it runs. That's kind of like knowing your entire supply chain, right? Transitive dependencies are a hard thing. Um, and even if you know who they all are, you might not know everything that they're doing. Um, so there's a lot of change afoot in response to this. Other browsers have already taken some very dramatic steps, including mostly eliminating third party cookies in some cases. Um, but there's another side to the story. The ability to personalize ads based on data that was collected about cross-site behavior turned out to be a huge component of what generates revenue on the web today. Our friends in Google Ads ran an experiment on the top 500 sites where Google places ads. They treated ad requests as if they were cookie-less and measured the drop in revenue to publishers, and they saw a 52% drop in revenue on average. And if you look specifically at news sites, the average revenue loss was 62%. And that is a Google study, but it's in line with a variety of other academic and industry analyses that have been done before and since. So just to be clear here, I'm not talking about the money that Google makes from ads directly. That mostly comes from ads on Google search, where people are kind enough to come and type into a little text box exactly what we should show them ads for. Right? But people only come to Google.com to search for stuff because of all the richness of the entire web. So helping the open web thrive is the mission for Google and is the mission for Chrome. So what is Chrome going to do? Uh, high level outline, which is also the outline of the rest of our talk. Um, first of all, uh, we announced in January that we, Chrome, are planning to get rid of third-party cookies with a two-year time horizon. Uh, other stuff will be happening to cookies between now and then. For example, we're changing the defaults so that even while third-party cookies are still allowed, they need to be explicitly labeled as such, and they can only be sent over HTTPS. That's a change rolling out 
uh, real soon now. Um, uh, but the time for third-party cookies uh, is coming to an end. Um, there are lots of things that third-party cookies are used for today, which are important parts of the web, and we need new ways to support these use cases. So we are hard at work on developing a collection of new APIs, ones that are designed to meet those needs without making cross-site tracking possible. Before third-party cookies go away, we need to give developers a well-lit path that will keep working even as we improve privacy. Um, and then, as I said, a lot of money rides on using cookies for cross-site tracking. And that means there's a large incentive for various parties to move to other more covert tracking techniques when cookies aren't available. And when we get rid of third-party cookies, we really want that to actually stop cross-site tracking rather than triggering some years-long game of whack-a-mole against widespread circumventions. We know that's a real threat. Like the circumvention thing has been playing out in Safari since 2017. Um, so the other reason that the well-lit path I was talking about is so important is that it gives developers an option that is better than an endless circumvention war. Okay. So when we say get rid of third-party cookies, that's a statement about a technology, but we're really using it as a shorthand for a more abstract goal. So let's talk a little bit about what we're trying to actually prevent. Um, we published a privacy threat model that's linked here. Um, it's really about partitioning your identity while you're on the web. Different sites might each have their own notion of your identity, but those identities should remain distinct from one another. Me while I'm visiting newyorktimes.com should be a distinct identity from me while I'm visiting cnn.com. And the central privacy threat that we're focused on here is joining these like per site notions of the who the user is um, across distinct first parties. Uh, third party cookies are one example of what we should probably more generally refer to as unpartitioned state. That's any web exposed state which is the same when the user is browsing two different sites. Uh, APIs like local storage or IndexedDB or service workers cache storage, those are all examples of state which we're going to partition so that you can't store something while the user is visiting one site and then retrieve it while they're visiting another. Now, there may be times when the user genuinely wants multiple sites to know the same identity or wants a site to know some of their real world identity. As an extreme example, obviously your credit card info is the same no matter what site you're on. And that is fine as long as the user is giving out information or joining up identities deliberately. But we certainly don't want it to happen automatically with no user intent or while they're just trying to go about their regular web browsing activity. Note that partitioning identity is not the end of the privacy discussion. For example, disclosure of sensitive information about you can violate your privacy even if it's just to a single site. So there's ongoing work in the W3C's privacy interest group to write a more comprehensive privacy threat model for the web as a whole. Okay, now I'll give you a whirlwind tour of both the new APIs and the anti-circumvention work. Uh, the, there are a lot of individual projects under this umbrella. Many of these are extremely cool work backed up by innovative research uh, my apologies, but this will really just be an impression of the range of work going on with just a single sentence about each one. If you want more details on any effort, uh, look for pointers on the Privacy Sandbox homepage on chromium.org, which is linked from the slides here and should be easy to find with your favorite search engine as well. Okay, uh, so new APIs. Um, the first use case is combating spam and fraud and invalid traffic. Uh, and there we're looking at Trust Tokens, an amazing tool that lets the browser hand a message from one server to another server in a way where it's cryptographically secure, but it can be provably constrained to say something like a single bit of information, I trust this user, or some other constraint that the browser can cryptographically guarantee is all that's being passed. Um, second, there's a bunch of measurement APIs. Uh, there's one specifically for ad conversion events. That's where an advertiser wants to learn which ad clicks that it paid for led to purchases that made it money, even though they can't tell which visitor on the publisher site matches which customer on the advertiser site. Uh, there's another API for more general aggregated measurement, 
uh, that involves infrastructure based on secure multi-party computation that makes it possible to learn statistics aggregated over a population, even while there's provably no way to learn anything about any specific user or event. Uh, then there are some ad targeting APIs. Uh, there's one based on in-browser clustering of similar users into large cohorts that advertisers can learn about over time and choose to advertise to as a large group. Uh, there's another one based on advertisers creating their own groups to show an ad to uh, without the advertiser learning what site any individual person visits and without the site owner learning what advertisers are showing ads to any particular person on the site, even if the publisher and advertiser are happy to collude to share that information. So we make it possible to put the ads there without that information being shared, even by willing parties. Um, uh, then there's uh, federated login. There's the web ID proposal so that the browser can intermediate the data exchange between the site you're visiting and your choice of identity provider, making sure that information is only shared between sites when you explicitly intend to do so and so that you can understand what the information being shared is. Um, now on to the workarounds. Uh, again, this is just a sample of what we are doing. There's more to it than this, but uh, high level buckets include cache partitioning. Uh, I mentioned access to global unpartitioned state before through APIs like cookies or IndexedDB, but really many browser caches are also global state um, and their contents may be subject to inspection directly like executing cache JavaScript or header inclusion and conditional get HTTP request. Um, or uh, can be probed unintentionally via things like timing attacks. Uh, a browser really is just a, a large collection of caches, and we need to make sure that they're all partitioned appropriately. Um, second, there's combating fingerprinting. Um, our main effort here starts with measuring how much browser instance identifying information is given out as a website uses various browser APIs with the intention of distinguishing uh, normal from egregious information collection, telling the difference between a site that uses three fonts to display text and a site that tries to use 500 fonts just to create a, a hash of which subset of them are available to identify you. Um, uh, the next bucket is network level tracking. Uh, this covers things like DNS over HTTPS and encrypted SNI, which target attackers where an on the wire observer, like your ISP, for example, could build a profile of all of your browsing. Um, there's a broader uh, problem of IP address privacy, where we're considering a basket of possible approaches that span technical and audit-based and policy-based, but all of which have downsides. This is a really hard problem. Um, and there are more as the people who want to track get increasingly desperate. All right, thank you, Michael. Uh, that was a great um, overview of the mission of the Chrome Privacy Sandbox team and uh, a little bit of information about how we're making it, making it happen. Uh, I'd now like to spend a little bit of time to explain some of the concepts that Michael talked about in more concrete terms. And my goal here is to really lay out a few key principles that you can keep in mind to help us out as you're building new web platform APIs. Um, even as we evolve the web platform by adding powerful and useful capabilities, we also want to make sure that we're not introducing new tracking mechanisms. First, let's dig into the concepts and terminology that you probably will hear us talk a lot about. Um, and uh, these should help you think about the scenarios that you should anticipate and hopefully document in your design documentation when you're thinking about security and privacy considerations. Uh, let's look back at this page that Michael showed us, right? It's it's a you, you it's a page that has a lot of different sub resources. Some of these are first party, and some of these are from third parties. Uh, now let's inspect some of the elements in the page. Uh, on the top right, we have a login iframe, and this is served by uh, the, the top page URL here, by the way, is chromeu.com. Um, this is a made up URL, it doesn't actually exist. Um, and so the login iframe in this case is served by an origin or a subdomain that's on the same uh, domain as the top level page, which is accounts.chromeu.com. And right below that, we have another iframe, um, which is a different domain. It's chromeublog.com, but presumably it's they're sort of related domains. Maybe they're owned by the same organization. And then you see that there's there are links to um, you know that site and there is a client ID URL parameter that's passed along and this is typically used by analytics to measure and understand traffic patterns across sites. 
And then we have two red boxes here. These are third parties. One, in a, one is an analytic service and the other is an ad act frame. So what constitute first party? Right. Today, there a lot of web platform features do rely on this notion of site, which kind of implicitly defines first party. Um, and the way we define this is that they are, a, you know, origins that have a common scheme, the common URL scheme, and also have a common registrable domain. And these are what we designate as being same site or first party. However, in reality, we do see that there are domains that are related by, you know, virtue of being owned by the same organization. And it does make sense sometimes to maintain them as two different domains. Um, and to solve, to tackle this, what we're doing is working on a proposal called first party set, which will hopefully make, give us a more satisfying definition of what first party means. Um, and essentially, when requests are when requests are made fr from a URL that's first party with the top level document, as well as all the ancestor frames and the iframe hierarchy, uh, that may, that's what we define as first party context. Uh, and then conversely, there's third party context, which is basically when there are requests happening across origins that have either a different URL scheme or a different registrable domain. Those are what we call third party to each other. Now, if we look back to our example, like we, we talked about the sub resource requests that we have to the ad tech company as well as the analytics company would be, you know, happening within third party context. Uh, a key thing to remember here is that, you know, when we're sourcing third party scripts on as, you know, and implicitly importing them to into like a top level document like this, uh, that script now has access to first party storage and any script visible cookies that are owned by that top level site, which is phonemu.com. So today, most cross-site tracking is enabled via state, um, and that's by and large third party cookies. Um, and like in this highly simplified scenario, for instance, you have an ad, ad you know, ad, ad iframe that's that's embedded in chromio.com and uh, you know, the, 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 the ad tech company, for instance, could set a cookie with a user ID. And the next time you're visiting a, another page, and if they happen to embed uh, you know, a resource from the same site, they now get that cookie as well as, you know, the location of the page you're at. And that's kind of how a user profile essentially gets built. Um, however, cookies are actually, a, you know, it, it, they could be cleared. So you, you have, the user has control over forcing third parties to forget who they are. A much more problematic way of tracking uses something called browser fingerprinting. Essentially, sites can um, inspect or query information that could be used to extract a fairly unique fingerprint to identify users. Uh, and this technique uh, removes reliance on availability of third-party uh, states and unfortunately is persistent across clearing of state or clearing of your browser history. Um, and there's you know, very well-known libraries that actually enable this. Now, fingerprinting essentially relies on headers and APIs that each reveal small amounts of identifying information about the device. For instance, it could be your you know, characteristics about your hardware or the media that you, media devices that you have connected, or the user. Maybe it indicates something about your preferences and settings. And so when the, this information is combined, they can form a relatively identifying stable fingerprint. Um, and, and, an, and an important concept to keep in mind here is entropy, which uh, you know, I grabbed the Wikipedia definition uh, where it defines it, uh, which, which defines entropy as the average level of information pr present in a variable as possible outcome. Right. And our estimation is that it takes about 34 bits of information to identify a unique device. And that's computed based on the number of, you know, if you just Google uh, the number of connected Internet devices and then take a long base too, that's kind of the number that you get. Um, and when we are when analyzing the potential for a web API to reveal fingerprints, we typically think about how many bits of information is it revealing and what does that entropy distribution look like? Our goal really here is to reduce the number of information, uh, the amount of information an API can give away while we still accommodate for the usefulness of that API. Um, and then there's stable fingerprints. These extract, so there's two kinds of fingerprints when we talk about it, one is stable and one is ephemeral. Uh, and stable fingerprints essentially extract information that's pretty stable within the order of days. And they're likely, be to, likely to be different for different users. Um, and if you go clear your history or clear your state, that does not eliminate your fingerprint because it's, it's stable across all of that. Um, and some common ways of extracting stable, print, uh, stable fingerprints are canvas operations. For instance, uh, a site could perform some canvas operations and then read back uh, the result as pixels and essentially compute a fingerprint uh, that's based on your graphic stack. Um, font, uh, font fingerprinting is another common technique. Um, and there's another form of fingerprinting that's like less lesser talked about, I think, and this is uh, correlating or joining user identifiers 
by observing events or volatile attributes across site boundaries. Um, and, and a few examples here are device orientation and you know, ambient light sensor events. And also you know, an example of like volatile properties is, is accelerometer readings. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the design considerations uh, to keep in mind to prevent the possibility that your feature could become a novel means for cross-site tracking. Um, and a lot of these uh, principles are actually grounded in the privacy threat model that Michael talked about earlier. Um, so if I'd like to call back to a principle that Michael talked about, which is your identity on NewYorkTimes.com should not be correlatable to your identity on CNN.com. Um, and we talked a little bit about how, how this identity joining is possible today with state that's available in third-party context and what we're doing to tackle those. However, it turns out there are less obvious mechanisms that have been used in the past as cross-site communication channels. And a couple of examples here are the HSDS super cookie, which essentially leverages the browser's HSDS cache uh, and encodes an identifier in, into that bit, which says this, this origin requires an HTTPS, uh, it requires HTTPS. And then another thing called Evercookie, which was this way of like creating zombie cookies, which even, even if you went and cleared their, your cookies, they had a persistent way of bringing them back. And so uh, just a, a little bit of information about the, some techniques that you can keep in mind to prevent creating new tracking vectors. If you are adding a new type of state or cache, consider partitioning it. Uh, by the top level site. So this ensures that the third party doesn't have access to shared state across many first parties and so cannot join your identity. Um, and if you're designing a new API with the explicit goal of allowing cross-site exchange of information, such as the, the APIs that Michael talked about earlier, there are statistical techniques such as like fuzzing with noise and aggregation that you could use. Um, another technique also that Michael talked about with the Trust Tokens API is to share low entropy identifiers where it's potentially a single bit of information that's being conveyed uh, as opposed to a, like a persistent user identifier. Um, and lastly, you could also think of per site identifiers. This is something we're considering for the federated login API, for instance, uh, which tend to hand out global identifiers. Um, so having those provide per site identifiers instead um, would be more, uh, it would be better for users' privacy. Um, and then if you suspect that an API that you are designing could reveal details about the device uh, or the user profile, uh, here's a few mitigations that you can consider. Uh, you can think about data minimization, and this really means reducing the number of bits, the, not the, the amount of entropy that your API reveals. Uh, and some ways to do this could be to round it off, like do you need the level of precision that your API provides, um, and also by quantizing the values. Um, you could also think about gating access to that information with informed user consent, and this usually prevents things like drive-by fingerprinting. Uh, but a word of caution here with respect to consent, usually achieving informed consent is hard. Um, and also it's, 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 it's often hard to tell from a UI when you're giving a permission that the, the text there doesn't do a great job of disclosing the fact that all sites that have been granted access to that resource can then synchronize those identifiers as a side effect. Um, and then once you've given, you granted your permission, unless you revoke it, essentially it, it, you know, the site has access to that information uh, until you revoke it. And, and of course, another problem could be consent fatigue. Um, Another uh, technique uh, that we commonly recommend is to restrict the API to the top level and the, fo the currently focused site. Um, and also if, if there is an iframe, for instance, that needs access to the API, you could consider delegating it via feature policy instead of making, having it be available by default. Um, and we found that this tends to fit well with the usage model for most APIs. Um, and finally, uh, there's a, you know, a notion of active and passive fingerprinting. So passive fingerprinting is where you're extracting information that's like available to you instead of like asking for it. So this is like making people ask for that information instead of giving it to them without asking. 